Yeah, give them a round of applause. They deserve it. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. And Chag Sameach to those of you who are celebrating. Um, my name is Ruthie Fierberg. I'm the executive editor of Broadway News, which is the home for original journalism on Broadway. I'm also the creator and host of a podcast called Why We Theater. But tonight, obviously, we are here to talk about another artistic medium, specifically film, and specifically this beautiful film, Rare Objects. Thank you all so much for your work in it. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you all of the people on this panel. Starting on my right, production designer Michael Fitzgerald. <laughs> Co-star David Alexander Flynn. Co-star Derek Luke. Star Julia Mayorga. Co-writer Faden Papadopoulos. And star, co-writer, co-producer, director, Katie Holmes. As a reminder, we do have some people floating around with um, index cards and writing utensils, so there will be some time for audience Q&A at the end. If you have a question, be sure to flag someone down, write down your question. I will ask as many as I can of these folks once we get through our portion of things. Um, but now I want to dig in. My time. <laughs> Katie, I, I want to start with you because to do all of those things that I just listed, to write, to direct, to star, to produce, means that you really must believe in the story, be drawn to the story, feel compelled to tell this story. And it was adapted, for those of you who don't know, from a novel by Kathleen Tassaro of the same name. What was it about the story, the novel, that drew you in and you felt, I, I have to tell this? Uh, I think it was a combination of I really connected to this story. I optioned the book. I loved the friendship um, between these two women. I loved this idea of um, this antique store being a special place for where uh, our main character sees herself differently and is seen differently and heals a bit. I felt like I, I believe in that. I believe in the power of art. Um, and I think it's, it was just a big challenge. Like it wasn't easy. And I think the more something is challenging, the more I want to do it. Um, but I, I do have a lot of titles, but all of these pe people up here are my friends and also very talented. So it's like, I wore those different hats at different points. So Faden and I, you know, we worked on this for years. He would come to New York. <laughs> we, we'd go through, pump out a draft, and then try again. Like, we kept working and working. We'd go and sit at different restaurants. We would go and visit different neighborhoods. And, you know, Michael and I have been with it forever. David helped us with a short film that we did to try to raise money. Oh, wow. It was, it was a long process. So. All of those things kept me motivated mm -hmm. um, and also validated what my instincts about, I think this is something that, like, if, that people will relate to. Yeah. What made you want to tell your own version of the story? Like, the book, for those who don't know, set in Depression-era Boston. Here we are, present-day New York. And I know that you said some of that comes down to budget, and I have a question about that as well. But setting and you know time and place aside what made you feel like not just i believe in this story but i have something to say through my lens on this story and i'll ask you first but i'm interested faden in your answer as well i think what was very clear when we were for me when we were trying to adapt the book um, as it was in 1930s boston it was finding the themes that are relevant to today. And then at a certain point you go, well, that's ask, then we're gonna have to ask the audience to then connect our movie to their life today. Um, so that, you know, also making a period piece is, I realize that that's hard to ask 
for financing for, and it's also maybe a couple more films in, I would be more comfortable to make a period piece. I don't know. Um, you heard it here first. Now I'm, waiting. <laughs> now I'm waiting for what period you're going to pick. <laughs> but um, I also, um, what The Invisible Life, that movie that came out a couple of years ago with, um, do you remember the, the he's an uh, Algerian director. Um, it was a beautiful movie. But some of his, um, some of his shots were just also something that were very inspiring for this movie, but, um, and it wasn't necessarily, was it, I don't think it was period. So anyway, so a lot of different things like kind of, like along the way you're like, huh, that's interesting, or I wonder if this would work. So yeah, kind of an comes idea, through all of that, yeah. Yeah, Faden, what about for you in finding the beats to lean on as you were setting out this version of the story? Um, it's a very good question. I, I, I worked with Katie, as she mentioned, um, gosh, five, five years ago now. We've probably worked for six months. Um, and the, the, the novel, for those of you who have read it, has, is, is incredibly rich and dense. And um, there's so much backstory for all of the characters and so much history. It's what I loved about it, but also we knew immediately that we would have to make some, some choices. Um, and ultimately, really, I mean, Katie, it's you that I think st turned the story from one um, about a, a young woman who is hurt and then also and finds her confidence and also finds romance with some, she find, in, the, in the novel she has a, a, a romantic relationship with James um, that's a bit more, that's far more intense and also with Winshaw and um, early on Katie noticed that that felt that that was not what this story should be and that it should be about friendship, healing. Um, and that was a big shift, and it was... Well, like, there wasn't enough time to fit it all in. Mm -hmm. So that's why you kind of flirt with the idea of both James and Winshaw. Like, you... you right, there's always, the possibility there's of the it There's the possibility there. at the end, and I felt like that was more authentic and, 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 and easier. I, I just, I felt like it was too much to ask of Benita to do, Well, do that's all the that other thing, is emotionally. it also refocuses it on her as opposed to what people want from her continuously, right? It's about, you know, the collective healing. There's that moment in the movie where um, the cup pieces are laid out and Alan's character and Derek, your character, are like, all right, come help me with this. And I also found that interesting just as an idea because I thought of that artistic practice as one visual artist sitting down with, you know, gold, glue <laughs> and, and figuring it out. And the idea, the metaphor for me of like, here are all these people reteaching her how to trust, right? Like she was really hurt by one man and then here are these multiple men and crucially this woman who are all rebuilding her back together. So I, I love that you didn't go into the intense romance. It's a different movie, mm -hmm. it's a different movie. Um, in talking about New York and being able to set it here, Michael, you know, it's as the production designer, you're tasked with creating the look, the feel, the mood. Um, you determine the New York that we see. And for those of us who live here, there are many New Yorks you can see. Talk to me about what the two of you wanted to achieve and what New York you wanted to create for Benny and for Diana. I mean, I think really authentic was really important to Katie and I. And I mean, the antique store that we found is actually was something that I walked by that luckily Katie had actually already been in. So we knew and actually it truly is that space with those three floors. Wait, that's a real antique store? It's not, no, it's, it was empty, but it's a real space. Yeah. In the sense that it okay, was, okay. But it was a space that had furniture at one point downstairs and we knew there was a weird basement. Um, there's a couple like weird, like lovely moments that you notice that it's all connected, but could almost be different spaces. But then it allowed us to really have New York outside that window. Um, and so I got these kind of wonderful collaborators to help, and we had these huge doors that Alan could open and close and, not, and really show New York. And then we get to the, you know, the final moment with Benita and it's you know, the taco place across the street and we're getting real art. That's the mask project that was from like a real New Yorker giving us that. But I think that transitioned this finding Queens. Because I think there was times like two years before, Katie and I were tromping around Bronx. We were, we were trying to figure out what world it was going to be. Um, but it was so great. It was the last train 
to Queens, and it would come, and her actual apartment was just a few blocks from that space. It was really important to Katie that it was really grounded in truth, and the, that we got the subway. We got the things that were really truthful. Yeah, like I think I read you say somewhere, like it's not landmarky New York. You're not seeing the Met. You're not seeing Times Square. You're seeing just the regular places that people travel to and from when you actually live here, and when it's you know, when it's the pounding of the pavement and figuring out how to survive. Um, Julia, I want to talk to you because while a lot of the world building happens in pre-production, then it becomes your job to inhabit the world. What drew you in the first place to Benny's world, to this world that they were creating that made you say, I want this part? Um, one, it scares me, <laughs> and I want to go towards the things that scare me, you know, um, it's a challenge, but also I kind of know Benita's story. Um, I, I relate to her in so many ways, and in so many ways I discover new things as I'm going. Um, but you know, I, I relate to having expectations of you, I relate, um, you know, like there, there's so many to, and to and for friendship, for female friendship, that saves you. Um, I there's just so many beautiful moments when I read the script that I was just like, this is so special, you know. This I would love to tell this story. This is, and thankfully I had wonderful creators who like they helped me along the way. You know, they you lean on them for support, and it made the job easier. I heard that you were cast very close to when production began. What did you see in Julia that kind of made Benny spark to life? That you said, she's, she's gonna bring X to this movie. We were missing that, and now we have it. Um, well, I, I, it was Thursday, it was, oh third week of pre-production, um, and it was starting to be like, you know, we don't have, we don't have Benita yet. Um, <laughs> we gotta, what's happening? And I, I was looking at tapes, and um, I can kind of, I can kind of tell in pretty much like 20 seconds. Yeah. Um, it's the way in which someone engages, and um, uh, Julia listened. And she was, it wasn't about the lines she was saying, it was what was going on, what the lines were doing to her. Mm. And um, I was like, oh my God. And then of course I called Michael. I said, you have to come over. <laughs> we found her. <laughs> and he did. He's like, I'll be over in 10 minutes. <laughs> like seven years, we get to do it. <laughs> we get to do it. And we sat at my oh, kitchen God. table and, and he was like, yes, it's her, it's her. I was like, it's her. I so. can't even imagine what a moment like that must really feel like. Yeah, when you're... and then we met. I was like, you want to do it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> please say yes, please say yeah. yes. Similarly, I mean, you over here, I don't want to ignore you guys. Derek, you know, you bring your own, well, Derek first, then David. Um, you bring your own presence and ethos into this movie, especially because you come in so late, right? It's almost, it's a, Juicy little surprise, right? Because we hear about you, my partner, and you think, oh, I'm just, we're not gonna meet the person that travels the world and finds these things, and then there you are, in this sort of mysterious way. I know that you worked with Katie on Alone Together. What's the chemistry like between the two of and you? And Pieces of April. And, oh. When we were babies. Awesome, okay, so third time. What's that chemistry like between you as a director and actor? What do you find that she's able to bring out of you on a set, and particularly in Winshaw? It, it, was, the, it was the dialogue. Uh, first of all, I think when we uh, alone together, like we were right sort of coming to the end of COVID. And, you know, I, I, have, I have two boys and, when I would go there, I would see a lot of industry folks and a lot of people from the industry was leaving LA and they were going to Texas and Arizona. And I got the most beautiful call 
uh, from Katie, and I think what was beautiful was that it seems like the industry was coming to a halt, but then a new industry, a new artist was coming. Because I knew that Katie of 2003, who was an actor, but I didn't know all this potential that was in her. And it was just like the pieces of April script. There was, you know, you read scripts, but you don't read beautiful stories. And I wanted to be a part of a beautiful story. And so I, I think my, my, my trust factor, because I've been directed by a few actor directors, and I love the freedom that that presents. And I love the synergy of her set, you know, and the openness of that set. So, and, you know, even my wife and I stepping out on our production company, I wanted to see, you know, the bravery, the risk taking, all that she embodied. And uh, yeah, I had to be a part of it. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Before I make you answer the second part, I, I I'm gonna tell a little secret that this doesn't surprise me at all because backstage in the green room, like you are the joyful leader, right? Like she was like, I'm gonna play a pump up song before we go out there. And I was like, <laughs> her set must be amazing because everybody probably wants to show up, wants to do good work and has that vibe of like bubbly creativity in the air because she's bringing it. Um, so now I'm going to make you answer the second part of the question, which is tell me about finding Winshaw and someone who has to come in basically halfway through the movie and what that is to like join. I know it's not the same as a play going from beginning to end, but what is it to join the middle of a story and know who he is? Can I, can I say something before you start? Right. Please. Also, Derek came in... Um, I think a week and a half before we finished. So he's coming into very tired crew members, very tired actors. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we were also COVID testing all the time. And so he came in with this like energy that revitalized all of us. So go for it. <laughs> so thank you. But <laughs> I, you know what? I, I, I didn't see all that, but um, I, I love. Um, I, I love I love New York. First of all, um, I grew up in Jersey, but used to ca catch the path and just walk the street, get me a pizza and a sabaro and a pineapple juice, and I would just walk. And so I was walking in the neighborhoods that I dreamt of living in, let alone working in. So um, um, I was I, I think for me for the Winshaw, I was trying to. Uh, figure out, you know, the relationship. And I guess where I connected was uh, I've come through a stage in my life where um, not using my voice. So I love the dialogue between him and Julia about what is art. Mm -hmm. Art has a voice. And my mom used to work in Merrill Lynch, and every time my brothers would come, she would make sure we looked a certain way. And I think it was really important, but I used to, I didn't know what my voice was. And so I, I, the only thing I could capture coming in as, as Winshaw was the dialogue that we had was about, you know, art is authentic, let it breathe. And when you come from like an inner city and you come to money making Manhattan, you can get lost in your voice. And so I guess that's the only thing I jumped out on. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about a specific scene that happened, well, it was a pair of scenes. One of them involves the two of you. Um, the selling of the painting of the decaying morals. Mm -hmm. Because I became obsessed with the juxtaposition of these two scenes. So you have, you know, Derek and, and you, Julia, and Alan, and Benny's trying to like make it better than it is, and Winshaw gets so upset right? Mm -hmm. Don't try and make it more palatable. Don't try and make it prettier. Mm -hmm. And then the compliment to that scene of the next time she tries to sell the painting, she's leaning into the truth of it, but in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. And those dual scenes to me, again, spoke to the center message of this movie of it's not 
It's not about making something prettier. It's about seeing it mm. in, a, in a pretty way. And I'm so curious how that pair of scenes came to be, and Julia, for you, what it was like to grow as Benny from one to another. I guess let's start there, about growing in her from one to another. Um, yeah, I remember the day that we were shooting that scene and I felt uh, as Benita when we were doing it like almost offensive towards what I, because I was like, I'm doing the right thing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what you told me. I, yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to sell it my way, you know, um, and I remember the, the energy because he's so opinionated in that scene that I just like, the, the guard just goes up, you know, it just goes like, like, what am I doing wrong? And then I think Benita's hard on herself, so it's, you know, the disappointment of, like, I can't get it right, you know? Like, I can't get it right again. Um, but it is beautiful to go through the journey, and then that next scene, when I do get it right, it isn't everybody else's way. It's still, like, unique to Benita, you know? It's unique in, in, in her own way of, you know, taking little parts of what she's learning from everyone, but... Um, but still saying. Yeah. Faden and Katie, were, was that pair of scenes always in the script? It, it wasn't in the book. It was something that we discussed early on. We, we wanted them to have a confrontation. And, and to, to Julia's point, I mean, she is doing the right thing. And, you know, um, Winshaw... Well, yeah, because Kessler tells her to tell a story. Absolutely. No, and, and you know, um, Winshaw has this kind of incredible existence where he can travel around the world and find these objects, but he doesn't have to sell them. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of one of those scenes where no one's necessarily right or wrong, but where she ends up kind of incorporating his, his morals and his ideals into how she is then going to tell the story, um, I think was, that was what was exciting to us. Yeah. Derek, did you want to add anything about that first scene from your perspective and, and finding your way through it? Um. I don't know if we, we talked about it. I think I, to be totally honest, um, like being in the space, that, that space, that area, uh, a lot of times when you, just honestly speaking, like you go into a room and a room where maybe people don't look like you, you're looking for something to be comfortable, mm -hmm. someone to relate to. And I, I thought, the, the very, at first I was, I was a little pissed at Winshaw, because um, I thought he came in a little hot. <laughs> um, but I've had mentors, uh, not to segue, but my, my first movie being directed by an actor, I was approaching it a certain way. And uh, Mr. Washington said to me, he was like, take it to the bricks. Bricks is, uh, in the inner city, there's a particular area, like a rough area. And I was just presenting, I was just approaching, acting a certain way. Mm -hmm. And he was just like, knock it off. Show up, you were showing off your technique. I was trying to do technique. And he was like, take it to the bricks. Like, and that's a local, colloquial, only a homie will say that to you. <laughs> and once he did that, I started talking about, hey, this, this view is funky. Yeah. You know what I mean? I like just the, the edge yeah. in it, like, hey, wake up. You're, you're special. That's what makes this painting special. Mm -hmm. And both of you have unique voices. So I guess maybe that's what I was trying to reach for. Yeah. I don't know. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. David, yeah. I, oh, go I for it, Michael. The last thing is, he also reminded me, luckily we're so comfortable that I had forgot the bread in the photo. Mm -hmm. um, and my nephews here made the artwork. It was one of the hardest pieces in that whole store to do. Because when you're trying to make something that's so old, but also now, that you were so sweet. I love our collaboration, because you were just like, Michael, where's the bread? Because it's like, there's like, I was like, we worked so hard on it for like a month, and I was like, oh, yeah, no problem. We're going to get some bread in there. Lisa so had to do some bread. creative things, <laughs> creative things there. No, it's That's, much more beautiful than Thick Gosh We are all a team we on this team. set, and we're like, okay, don't tell that person they're having a day. Okay, tell that person. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, okay, wait. Now you, now you brought it up. So, David, you're so patient, and I'm going to ask you so many questions. Oh, but, yeah, Michael, you bring up the creation of that object in particular, tell me about the rare objects in this store. Did, yeah, no were they found? The Did you make them? A combination of the two, like, how do you, 
it, it's this combination of like messy and elegant, no, right? We wanted, we wanted to be really curated. I mean, luckily we've been on it for seven years, so I've gone through all the different chapters, so I know all the antiquity parts, but it opened it up when we did, so it was like I could have my friend Rebecca Green's beautiful parrots, I could have my brother's beautiful David Fitzgerald's owl, and I could have, you know, Zach's father's, Zach's father, Zach Posen's father's beautiful art piece in there, um, quilted, you know, cardboard art, just all these beautiful, and then get Kentridge jewelry, all that jewelry, that's real. So my decorator here, Beth and I, like we were for one, for 24 hours, we had all the most beautiful jewelry in all of New York at our table. So the stuff wow. that she's grabbing is real. So it's like we didn't, there was never gonna be something that wasn't real. Um, and I loved when we figured out the mask scene, that was like a, you know, something to go way back into time. And so I found this beautiful mask man in New York who lives in an apartment that we all, who, I'm glad I went there. And I got, but I got all these I feel like there are things. more stories you could There's tell so many about more that stories. apartment. <laughs> but I mean, it made, it was so great. And for their scene, it's like, it's delightful, but those are, that's, that's real. Everything in it is actually stuff that, so it, we had to be, and the same, and then Benita's house, I had to make that house just as authentic as well. It had to be, a, you know, our, you know, and we had a decorator with artwork. All those photos are real family photos yeah, of you Cuban. Can tell. It's, you know, that. And, and one of one of the um, pieces in her room is from our dear friend who made it, right, Brenda. And but uh, the the irony is like a lot of the pieces in the store, especially the jewelry and some of the like the wallpaper. I'm I'm not sure, but like from the 20s and 30s. Yeah, so we, like we, we were kind that. of, that was our homage to the, to the Well, and I had, I think actually Newell Props is here, Jake is here, and he yes. gave us this amazing, just that I could have, like I would have never been able to do those doors in a movie or all the stained glass, but he gave us kind of the doors and tickets. But one thing that was really cool that's a fun film thing, we put everything up on wheels so that when we're in the store, the objects are just as important as the people. So it's not like you're just looking off that was kind of a fun, so it was also really fun, we're just wheeling everything around the store everywhere, but then also we could use things over and again, but I think everybody should use that for now. It was really a really That's fun awesome. thing to do. And so, David, like the first, that first scene when you walk in with Katie and you know, it's the arrival of the patrons, do you feel the energy in that store because you're surrounded by all of these different antiquities and periods? Like, does that impact the way you, then move and interact with the space itself? Yeah, I mean, Michael did such an amazing job, and I think particularly for James, his role is to be delicate, because he's constantly navigating his sister, who's always on the brink of madness or total insanity, and, and then he meets this girl, and he falls for her, and she's precious, like the objects in the space. And so I think I really, I kind of just try to really just approach him with that same sensibility and sensitivity to, to everything around him. And, you know, he's a guy that like never gets to just get to be him. He's always like catering to everybody around him. And, I mean, he taught me a lot about my life, you know, and I think it was like, really helpful. I'm so curious if you're willing to share what yeah, I mean, some things you learned from him. I mean, Katie and I met in a, met actually doing a photo shoot where I was photographing her and we did this interview. Um, and it's in that interview where she was like, have you thought about acting? Mm. And I was like, well, I've actually been, you know, my, I've always wanted to direct and, and I write screenplays and, and so I'd taken, um, acting classes kind of secretly for two years because my sister, I have an older sister who would always used to shame me like, what are you trying to be an actor, dude? <laughs> I'd be like, no, not me. <laughs> Look at him now. He's in I didn't Holmes try movie. it and I didn't love it. <laughs> and, and so I was like, oh, whoa, like she kind of like sees that I don't get to like express like, she sees my role between my friends on set as a photographer. We had kind of, you know, we had really connected and we did like a three and a half, three hour interview and so we had really connected and she got to know me and she was like, oh, well, I think, or at least this is my perception, she's like, oh, I think this dude is really similar to Jimmy, like doesn't voice himself, doesn't get to express himself. Um, 
And a lot of Jimmy standing up in the film taught me to kind of bring that back to my life. And, you know, and realizing that when you let things linger, you're doing yourself a disservice, but you're also doing a disservice to your loved ones. Yeah. I mean, what you said about James seeing Benita as precious, and quite frankly, Diana, the same way, right? Like, I think that's why their relationship is so special, because he sees her struggle, but he doesn't write her off because of it. He, he you know, he carries her. He, he holds her because of it. And I love that about him. Well, we, that was one of the things that we, David brought a lot of insight to, to this character because, you know, uh, of course I respected him as an artist, um, as a photographer, um, as a writer. Um, I, I didn't really realize that his acting aspirations. Um, but when I was thinking about James, I was like, he's got to, he can't be someone, because he turns Diana in, and he's always sort of watching her, following her, and then he's, he kind of has a crush on Benita. I mean, it's very gentle, and this story really is Benita's story. So how is this all serving? And I was like, James has got to be gentle, but he, but he can't look it, right? <laughs> In terms of, like, he still has to be, like, like a bat, like yeah, like you have to not know about him at exactly the beginning. mysterious. Yeah. Um, and so I was like so excited. David said he would do it, and then we started talking about our characters' relationship, and and um, it, he, it was very helpful because it was like we didn't have the scene where um, we were in the restaurant and he uh, says what's going on with you, and we get into a fight. And we also, at that point, didn't know how they were gonna send Diana away. Like, all of that was a little bit like, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. And it was because of what we talked about, and like, we, we he kept saying, no, like, this, this is uh, very codependent. He hates, like, Diana's been this source of, like, he can't move on in his life because he's always taking care of her. Um, and it's a very subtle, well, it's, I mean, this exists in so many, dysfunctional families, like, uh, it's just something that, like, he, that's his role. Um, and so we really wanted to kind of show that pain. And then because we worked on that scene, it would inform, like, oh, then when she's sent away, it's just really simple. And then it's right. also, wait, Benita, like, now she's, you know, kind of right, was like the her friend is her, her And anchor. she doesn't know what, the dynamics of the family are. Right. So it's like very powerful because she kissed him. You know, <laughs> so we were trying to like, it really helped put the, the puzzle together. Yeah. It, it was quite a departure from the novel as well because <laughs> is in the novel and in our first scripts, James is, ends up being a philanderer, a liar. Um, and he, he's, you know, he's, he's complicit, sorry. Uh, he's complicit in, in keeping Diana's illegitimate son away from her. He's really, a, he's really a, a, a mean guy. Um, Diana had a baby in one version. Yeah, and, and it's so interesting watching it now and, and seeing that actually, you know, in that last scene, he can't even look at her, and it's because he really does care about her. And, it, and, even, and even her mother says, it just says, I, I love you. In the book, her mother is a monster. And it, like, the fact that her family isn't made out to be this, this like, cliche, overbearing, um, like upper crust American dynasty family, um, it makes the fact that she still, Diana still can't pull through and cope, it makes it all the more tragic, I yeah, think. Yeah, you see that, that rock and hard place in that scene. I mean, David, I, I want to hear about shooting that goodbye scene because it's, I think, mm. it, it's so emotional for what each of you <laughs> is doing in it. His devastation and her consoling him. Like, I, I get it, it's okay, yep, like, Mm -hmm. And that, again, like that duality is what makes it so powerful. What do you remember from the set that day and, and finding that in yourself? It was my biggest fear. Oh, like, I think the thing about acting was like, I had this like very kind of um, popular assumption that it was super hard to cry on camera. Mm. And, and, 
and I was like, oh man, like she didn't, it wasn't written in the script, it wasn't, but I was like, I gotta do some, <laughs> like, <laughs> this is the time to do some, and, <laughs> and I was like, don't freeze, bro, and then I, and I remember there was a grip, and it was late, it was real, that scene was really late, and, and he was eating Doritos. <laughs> And every time we were filming, he would just slowly put a Dorito in his mouth and crunch it. Like and I was, tr I was trying to stay. You know, I like finally found some tear, uh, some 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 swelling, some water in there. I was like, "Whoa, I'm doing it!" And then because of the Doritos, th then the Doritos start crunching. I'm like, "Man, I'm gonna keep it cool, but I'm trying." But I, I mean, that. <laughs> <laughs> just in slow mo, too. You can't just be in charge of literally <laughs> everyone. That same person, our DP, had to yell at him. I didn't like he was he was playing a with the with the dolly, and it was and it was someone. It was another big scene, and he was like on his phone during a close up. And he also has tattoos of women's no more bodies. On no his more arms. Katie Holmes. Just one part. Of no, that. and no Doritos on set because they're the crunchiest and loudest. <laughs> So please, do not give Doritos on set. And yet set. you managed to give us that anyway. Well, I was just about to say, like, it's really such a testament to Katie as a director and actress and, and Julia. And, like, it was, you know, like, we didn't get to have any scenes together. But it was, you just walked into that room and the level of emotional commitment that just transpired, it was like, I've always thought of, you know, like in pro, our acting programs and things like that, like acting is really, you know, you're kind of like an emotional engineer. You're, you're building these bridges between reality and, and, and not fiction because it is someone's reality and some sure. hypothetical place. But, she allowed us to connect so much to the characters that when you walked in there, it wasn't this logical thing anymore. It was totally alchemical. Mm -hmm. And I realized there was this, there was this almost like dew in, in the air. And as soon as I walked in, it just it was like a hook in my chest. Wow. And I was like, this is what we've been and she made me such such a she made all of us such a part of the script of building the script. And she was like, "What do you think? Like, would you say this? Like, would a girl your age like you now are that character? So I'm right. gonna trust you to tell me what that character would feel or how he'd react. And mm. and and really having a voice in that process allows you to connect so much better. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I want to get to some audience questions, but Katie, I did want to ask you about the character of Diana and not just creating, you know, this this whole film, but that very specific performance. Um, you know, from the moment we meet her, when it's you know, it's not in here, it's out there. She's so locked in on her, on the way she sees the world, and I just found. I mean, the reason that scene is so heartbreaking is because you feel so deeply for her. And I'm wondering, what, what was your hook? What was your grounding for her? I, I don't know if I'm really grasping at straws here, but I, I read that you sometimes write down lines from, from books um, that can stand alone. I didn't know if there was a line in this book that helped you find Diana or from somewhere else that made you find her. Uh, I think what it was, it was... First of all, I, I was sort of, I work with um, uh, an, a lovely acting teacher and, and we were prepping Diana together and also the movie. And the way we work is like, you know, how does she relate to each person? What is her, per, her, her purpose, blah, 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 for each person? And this story has always been Benita's story. And so it was important to me that it's, you know, we see what happens to Benita, and then what? It, why? Why is there Diana? Well, Diana is like the first, the first friendship that's like she's got to be like the fairy godmother, the joy, mm -hmm. the, all mm -hmm. of this. That's her purpose. That's going to open Benita a little bit more. Then there's going to be James, and he's going to be the gentle man that 
teaches her, you, can ha you deserve a bike ride and a kiss, that's it, nothing else. Yeah. And that can be your reality. So that's another opening. Then there's Winshaw, who's like the wise, maybe romantic, not yet, um, and someone who's traveled. He represents what her life could be. Mm -hmm. And in the book, it's like, and it, he, there's a part where it's like, we could go together when they're at the, um, when they're looking at all the photographs right. at the window. It's like, it's that hint of, Benita, you deserve the biggest life you want to have. And, and that's why I was, you know, so, so anyway, so it's like all of these people, and Alan's character, Kessler, is like, yeah, art, this is going to also open you, and then we're going to see that he's broken. Yep. But it was still Benita's story, so everything had to get us to that place where at the end, she, on her own, says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go towards my life. Yeah. Because I've had all these people. So keeping that in mind, it was like, okay, Diana needs to be this person to her, and I want to believe their friendship. And it's like, I don't want her to be a cliche woman of privilege that doesn't know what the world is or maybe doesn't know what the world is, but isn't shallow. Mm -hmm. um, she's someone that is, is trying. Um, because otherwise, why would Benita connect, connect with, with her? her? I mean, Benita would be like, ew. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a big word. <laughs> yeah. um, sometimes you just need an ew. Sometimes it's an ew. <laughs> um, and so it sort of just came from there. and then. You know, with the, with ev working with everybody, it's like you do fall into that reality, and then it's fun, and then you try things. And when we were doing this, the the uh, Diana goodbye scene, it was like I looked at David, and I was like, oh no, it really made me so sad. Yeah. Because then I was thinking about, uh, you know, James and Diana, but also like hey, David brought so much to this. <laughs> you know, I got everything. I was like, right, the pride, the pride was, coming out too. They had, they had to yell "cut" because I was like, and then, um, <laughs> and, and so yeah, so it. That's what it was. Yeah, but it, I also wanted like one of the things I loved about Julia, is we we know that Benita has to go. We have to go with her through all this pain. But she's got to have joy, a spark, mm -hmm. and Julia naturally has that. Like. You know, she's fun and wonderful, and I wanted, to, I wanted to see that between the two of them and feel that, because that's how they're both going to keep going. Right. That's how we all keep going. Yeah, yeah. So. From the audience, um, for the creative team, what music and movies were part of the mood board of the film? Michael, do you want to start? <laughs> Some of your influences? <laughs> Um, so many. I mean, with seven years is a long time to go through things. But I mean, I think things like we saw a play that was really important that Katie and I saw, and that started to help the entire Benita Mom yeah. story. And one thing I love about collaborating with Katie, it's like we see something. We try, when you're actually working, by the way, you're not seeing this. So this is like before and prep and the years before. Because mm -hmm. I find when I'm actually working, it, I don't really want much information. Um, just Unless our we're world. rewriting at the last minute. Right, that too. Um, <laughs> but I love that all of a sudden it was this idea that Benita's mom needs to go to Cuba. And I think that came from something that we want, like that she doesn't just actually come back. You know, it's, it's her time. She's done so much for Benita. And she's like, come on, it's now your time. It's like your teenager has grown up. It's like, I get to go have that. And Katie and, discovered that. Through. And also it's... It's also, she has a life there. She, her home is actually there. And I think it's like, don't assume that just because she's been here and she was told this is going to be a better life for her daughter, like, she still has feelings. She's a person. She misses her family. Yeah. Like, that's okay to yep. say, you know? Um, so. Yeah, so that came from some theater in New York. And yeah, if, theater. if I could add one thing about what was great about the story is, um, I think oftentimes, we think it's roles like ours that are helping and transforming them, but it's actually them, I think, transforming us. Because like we have huge transformations from the beginning of the film to the end, where we have, you know, like my sister teaches me how to stand up for myself because she's fighting so hard for her truth. And like, as hard as it is, and as hard as it to like, put your finger on it because it's a constantly changing truth because of all the disorders. It's like she's still fighting for that so hard. And I have all this 
logic and rationale and knowledge on uh, culture and travels, but yet we're still learning so much from their struggles and their pain. Right. And I think that was like, to me, one of the most beautiful parts of the film that we always look to what we define as like victims, but when they're really just teachers and struggle is our teacher. Yeah, I mean, Julia, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, all of this healing emanates because there is something that needs to be healed. And grounding the story in Benita's story is, is all coming from a place of harm, that go, darkness that goes to light. And I'm curious how, how did you keep grounded in that particular scene? How did you keep yourself safe to then be open enough to allow her journey to continue? To allow her to open up after something like that? Um, how did I keep myself safe yeah. during the filming of the during during the filming of we'll just say because that's the, what it is the rape I think scene, words yes. are important during the rape scene yeah. that is an intense scene mm -hmm. how did you keep yourself safe during that and so that you could then continue to be open for the rest of it so I had a lot of help because that was a closed set uh, number one that was made me feel safe there was a coordinator as well. Um, and I was in a room and I had my music on and I was zoning myself out and preparing for the scene. Um, you know, uh, when you're doing these scenes, you, you don't really, it, it feels real, everything feels real. You know, it's not like, I'm like, this is pretend, it, 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 you know, your body starts right, your to Your body shake. registers it. Yeah, yes. everything's, um, but, even at, after we filmed the scene, I hug, we were hugging because it was so intense and I felt so supported by the women around. Um, it made it so much easier, it made me feel safe and it made me calm down, like it made me calm my nervous system down. Um, and then I remember on the car ride home, I was just like, I still kind of felt a little like, just not okay. Um, I was talking to my acting coach on the phone and I was like, okay, this feels really intense. Like, I don't know how to like take care of myself right now. Um, and we stayed on the phone for a little bit until I was like, okay, I went home. I took a bath and then, you know, we were shooting, it was so intense, we were shooting and I think um, it, it just informs me a lot. You know, it didn't, it didn't make me feel stuck. It just informed the next moment. Um, and, you know, it's, it's an important part of the story to tell. So I, I leaned on that. Um, and, the, you know, I, I trust Benita was like, you know, trying her best during the whole thing. Like she's, she's not, I mean, there's shame that comes with this. You know, there's like, you feel shame. You do feel, you do feel like, did I do something? You know, did I like, how could I have, like, there's all these thoughts that are happening, but, um, yeah. At the well, same like, there's that line, um, it's the, is it the film? It's the film that, kind of, the filter, the filter mm -hmm. and it through which you see that. everything now. Yeah. Yeah. But it makes you, I mean, you know, she's more alert, she's learning people, and she's, she walks through and still is open to the experiences. Yeah. There's a great audience question for all of you. We'll go down the line if you don't mind. Which rare object would you take from the store? <laughs> what, and I will add, <clears throat> why? What speaks to you from the store? I have to go last, because I love every single one. I mean, like, they're all my little children, so they're very. <laughs> all, all allowed, the production designer all allowed to go last. David, you're up. <laughs> um, I'll go for the Flemish painting. And why? Um, I don't know. I just, I just really liked what I really loved this scene you guys did together with the with the painting, and I think it was. Um, I just like that idea of paradoxes, mm. and I think James was such a paradox. So I think it's like a good ode to to the character and the experience. Awesome, Derek. <laughs> the bringer of objects. You know what? I really enjoyed the uh, the mask. 
um, there was something so playful about those masks. Like I, I felt like a kid, like I felt like a performer. Um, something that, you know, maybe you're walking by and you see someone, you know, doing a special act, but literally, I don't know what it was just a mask or it was how my body responded to it. Uh, you know, I would love to explore that world, you know, circus, mind, you know, using your body in a different way. Julia? I'm going to say the jewelry. <laughs> because I feel like, listen, the, the cruet was really, really cute. And I remember it was, I was just like, you know, like, I, but... Am I really gonna use layering, this? Layering. Am I really gonna use this? <laughs> and the jewelry, I mean, I am probably gonna lose it at some point because I lose everything, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna wear it as much as I can, which is, I mean, the, it, was, it was beautiful, timeless. Yeah. Love that. Fade in. I, I mean, I want everything. Um, my, my, my favorite, my, one of my favorite things about when we were writing was we would go to antique shops around Manhattan and uh, really all over New York, and they would, you know, we would be shown these incredible, uh, opal earrings that date to the Etruscan you know, like late period and Flemish tapestries and um, and then they would kind of look at us like, shall we wrap them? <laughs> <laughs> We're like, actually, no, we'll, we'll think about it. Uh, but I, was, I fell in love with all of the objects and, and, and just, uh, it was one of the things that I loved about the book and one of the things I still love about the film. But I think I, think I and maybe it's because I'm, I'm Greek, but I, I think I would take the vase. Mm, um, it, that was wild. And, and it's also, I, I think it's really fascinating that that period, like, it's, it's, I think it's attributed to Harold, the painter, who's, whose identity is not known. It's so old that, that this artist, who is now so uh, esteemed and coveted by the world over, um, doesn't have a name. He has, he has a, a fictional name, an identity. But it's just, it really just puts of history and art in and, and a context that I think is quite wild to wrap your head around. Katie, you can still choose the jewelry. <laughs> if it's, uh, if it speaks, uh, maybe it, it speaks to you for a different reason. I took it. <laughs> I think I, I love the um, the parrot, the because per, because that was also a really important thing Rebecca. to sh to see Benita convincing Kessler what of the story, mm -hmm. and yeah. we wrote that the morning of and. <laughs> Julia did a really good job. I was like, how am I gonna put this? How is it gonna stick to my brain? Yeah, that was that was tough. It was that, like a Monday morning, morning too. It, it was, was like, Monday wait, morning. we have a problem. We don't know why he's hiring her. <laughs> <laughs> we better we better figure that one out. You got it. We got, got there. We got it. We got it. But I also love that piece of art, the cardboard. That's good. Um, I was gonna say the Tennyson poems. Yeah. That, cause that is, and that was a real book that all fell apart. It's just like a rare object. Where you can't it? have it. I know, because I gave it to you. I have um, it. So, <laughs> so then I'll take one of Sandra's Benita's mom's cigars, because that was so great. When she discovered the cigars, that that's was cute. like... That's not from the shop. I know, but it's, I'm the production designer. I can choose from anywhere. Yeah, what, it was just, it was what object? Well, I guess I did say from the store, but I'll allow it. There were some it. cigars. I'll I'll put some, I'm sure okay, there were some cigars have the cigar. in the shop. I could sit here talking to you about this movie for another hour, but... We have to, unfortunately, let these people go home. Thank you for your excellent questions. You Thank guys you. asked a lot of things that they already answered with your amazing answers. I wanted, if I may, be so bold as to leave everyone with a quote from Katie. You didn't know I was going to do this, but I loved it. You said, um, I felt like if we all looked at each other that way as rare objects, maybe we would treat each other better. And so, please treat each other as rare objects. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming tonight. Rare Objects is in select theaters and on IFC On Demand beginning this Friday, April 14th. So tell everyone you know. We hope to see you back at the 92nd Street Y. I'm Ruthie Fearberg. Thank you again so much on behalf of this cast and company for coming tonight.